Hello, my name is, <coughs> is Bill Bogan. I am the pastor at Benson United Methodist Church. And today is Friday, April 15th, 2022, otherwise known as Good Friday. And Good Friday is the topic of my message today. For scripture, I'm coming out of John's Gospel, the 18th chapter, the first verse, through the 19th chapter, verse 42. That's John 18, verse 1, through 19, verse 42. <clears throat> After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples had entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I will not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that my father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. <clears throat> First they took him to Ananias who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and the other disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world, and I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said this, when the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer your high priest? Jesus answered, If I have answered wrongly, testify to the wrong. But I have, if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Ananias sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they asked him, Are you not also one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it, saying, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning, and they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, would we... We would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. But the Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what 
what Jesus had said when he ended the kind of time of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered his headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, So you're a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, What is truth? And after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it upon his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him going, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know I find no case against him. And so Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to, him, to, the, to them, Here is the man. When the chief priest and police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters and again asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat down on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to be crucified. And so they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, I have written what I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, now the tunic was seamless, woven from one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, 
but cast lots to see for to see who will get this. It was to fulfill what the scripture said. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. That is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to the woman, said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was a day of preparation, the Jews did not want bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the wound, one that they have pierced. After all these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus's, through a secret, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take him away, take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, and so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a guardian in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, the tomb was nearby, and they laid Jesus there. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> This is the darkest day, a day when not only the Pharisees and Sadducees were glad to finally have come, but the devil and all of his minions rejoiced as well. For today, not only did an unjust trial take place to convict him, but as they saw it, he was executed and killed. He would be out of their hair, out of their way. They would be able to get back to business as they knew it. It was a complete travesty of Jesus Christ, who Jesus, of whom Jesus truly was, and of his mission here. There were false witnesses, false testimony, all with one final goal, to nail Jesus to the cross. And they wanted him dead, because he was a threat to their religious power and their place in society. And Jesus' punishment began long before he was nailed to a cross. He was punched in the face by a Roman legion and had his beard ripped out by Roman soldiers. He was scourged. His entire body endured being whipped 39 times by a cat of nine tails. And then Jesus had to throw his own robe back upon him. And he had to carry his own cross up the steepest road in Jerusalem out to the hill called Golgotha a massive garbage heap where the crucifixion would be carried. Now, in his book, The Day Christ Died, Jim Bishop conveys the horror of such an execu execution. He writes, The executioner laid the crossbeam behind Jesus 
and brought him to the ground quickly by grasping his arms and pulling him backward. And as soon as Jesus fell, the beam was fitted under his back of his neck. And on each side, soldiers quickly knelt on the inside of elbows. Thorns pressed against his torn scalp. With his right hand, the executioner probed the wrist of Jesus to find the little hollow spot. And when he found it, he took one of the square-cut iron nails, raised the hammer over the nail head, and brought it down with force. Two soldiers grabbed each side of the cross stream and lifted, and as they pulled up, they dragged Jesus by his wrist. With every breath, he groaned. Then, when soldiers reached the upright, the four of them began to lift the cross beam higher until the feet of Jesus were off the ground. The body must have writhed in pain, and when the cross beam was firmly set, the executioner knelt before the cross. Two soldiers hurried to help. Each one took hold of the leg at the calf. The ritual was to nail the right foot over the left. It was probably the most difficult part of the work, because if the feet were pulled downward and the nail close to the foot of the cross, the prisoner died quickly. Over the years, the Romans learned to push the feet upward on the cross so that the condemned man could lean on the nails and stretch himself upward to breathe. Now, Chuck Swindoll adds, Excruciating pain accompanied every upward push for breath and every downward release from the fatigue. Each movement cut deeper into bone and tendons and raw muscle. Fever inevitably set in, inflaming the wounds and creating an insatiable thirst. Waves of hallucinations drifted the, the victim in and out of consciousness. And in time, flies and other insects found their way into the open wounds. At this point, Jesus knew he had accomplished everything the Father had sent him to do. To fulfill one less scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. They put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's from John chapter 19, 28 through the 30th verses. Those three words, it is finished, come from one Greek word, to Telestai. Now, the word to Telestai may be unfamiliar to us, but it was used by various people in everyday life in those days. A servant would use it when reporting to his or her master. I have completed the work assigned to me. When a priest examined an animal sacrifice and found it faultless, this word would apply. The word also means it is finished. It stands finished. It always will be finished. These words specify not the end of Jesus' life, but the comp completion of his task. It is the verb tense perfect. It is finished. The purpose of his hour had been completed. The consequences of his work are enduring. Max Lucado writes, The history of long plan redeeming man was finished. The message of God to man was finished. The works done by Jesus as a man on earth were finished. The task of selecting and training ambassadors was finished. The job was finished. The song had been sung. The blood had been poured. The sacrifice had been made. The sting of death had been removed. And it was over. Warren Wiersbe said, perhaps the most meaningful meaning of Tetelestai was that used by the merchants. The debt is paid in full. When Jesus gave himself on the cross, he finally met the righteous demands of a holy law, and he paid our debt in full. What then do we learn about the completion of our redemption? What do we learn about the salvation revealed in Jude chapter 1 verse 3 that says, Once for all delivered to the saints. Jesus' words, it is finished, provides us four glorious benefits. 
an atonement for sin, an access to the Holy of Holies and God, acceptance by God, and assurance of salvation. Firstly, atonement for sin. Warren Wiersbe writes, None of the Old Testament sacrifices could take away sins. Their blood only covered sins. But when the Lamb of God shed his blood, that blood can take away the sins of the world. You see, Jesus' death conquered sin and death. He purged our sins. 1 John 1, 7 But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have a fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanse, or the Greek, katharizo, K-A-T-H-A-R-I-Z-O, means to declare clean or make clean or purify. Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Not only did he purge our sins, but he conquered death. Hebrews 2 verse 9, But we see that Jesus, who made was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. John MacArthur also writes in his commentary on Hebrews, We see the extent of Christ's humiliation in his death. Angels cannot die, but Jesus came to die. He went so far beneath the angels that he did something they could never do. Death was not easy or costless. It was a suffering death. Christ's exit from the land of the living was not calm and peaceful but was accompanied by outward torture and inner agony. The death he tasted was the curse of sin. What Jesus felt while dying on the cross was the total agony of every soul in hell for all eternity put together, suffered in a few hours. All the punishment for all the sin of all time, that was the depth of Christ's death. He was guilty of no sin, Yet he suffered for all sin. God sent his son, and his son willingly came to die to redeem man. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Jesus Christ in his death proposed to die as a substitute for everyone. And it is only by the Son tasting death as a man for man that we are set free from death. Historically, kings would have someone taste their food, protect them from possible poisoning. But the cup of poison that belonged to us was drained to the dregs by Jesus Christ. He substituted his own life for ours and released us to live with God. Here from Hebrews 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus' death also caused a reconciliation unto God. Romans chapter 5, 8 through 11. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is translated from the Greek word kalalaso, to return to favor with, to receive one into favor, to put someone into friendship with God. So it restored our, brought us back into 
uh, being reconciled again to God. And secondly, it gave us access to the Holy of Holies, or God himself. Because of Christ's death, we now have access to God. In the temple, no one was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies, but the high priest on the Day of Atonement, which only occurred once a year. The Day of Atonement, which occurred on the tenth day of the seventh month, Tashiri, or September and October, was to serve as a reminder that the daily, weekly, monthly sacrifices made at the altar of burnt offering were not sufficient to atone from sin. Hebrews 10, verse 11, And every priest shall stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. On this day of the year, the atoning blood was brought in from the Holy of Holies, a divine throne room by the high priest as representative of the people. The high priest first sanctified himself by taking a ceremonial bath and putting on white garments. Then he had to make an atonement for himself and other priests by sacrificing a bullock. God was enthroned on the mercy seat in the sanctuary, but no person could approach it except through the meditation of the high priest, who offered the blood of sacrifice. After sacrificing a bullet, the high, the high priest chose a goat for his sin offering and sacrificed it, and he sprinkled its blood on and about the mercy seat. Finally, the scapegoat bearing all the sins of the people was sent into the wilderness. The scapegoat's scapegoat symbolized the pardon for sin brought through the sacrifice. <clears throat> Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the help of need. And because Christ's death, all sacrifices are no longer needed. Christ's sacrifice is effective because it removes sin which the other, other covenant could never do. The new covenant went from daily sacrifice to one sacrifice, from ineffective sacrifices to the perfectly effective sacrifice. And thirdly, not only did it, did it bring us access to God, but it brought us to acceptance by God. Through Christ's death, we are accepted by God. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, and to the praise of his glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. Because believers are accepted in Christ, then they, like him, are the Beloved of God. Now also know that through Christ's death there is no more enmity. Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, who has made both of us, has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And lastly, Jesus' death gives us assurance of salvation. Jesus' death, because of his sacrifice, was perfect and total. It never needs to be repeated. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Perfected, or in the Greek, to lead you to complete or to make perfect. The use of the perfective, perfected involves the completed cleansing of regeneration. In this we see the twofold nature of salvation. The believer possesses a positional and judicial standing of righteousness 
And secondly, remaining need for proactive and progressive holiness. The three factors make perfected ab the perfected absolute, suggesting the eternal security of the believer. The word itself, teleiu, involves completion, the bringing of something to its end. And the use of the Greek perfect tense suggests that the perfect, the perfection has been accomplished and it is, its effects of perfection are still continuing. Third, the modifier forever expresses the security for the believer. The death of Jesus removes all sin forever for those who belong to him. And we are totally secure in our Savior. We need cleansing when we fall into sin, but we never need fear God's judgment upon us because of sin. Because as far as Christ's sacrifice is concerned, we have already been sanctified and perfected, which is why he had to sacrifice himself only once. Jesus' death also guarantees us full assurance of salvation. John 10, 27-30 my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Also hear, hear from 1 Peter 1, chapter, 3, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his begot, abundant mercy has begotten us again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So what does Jesus' death mean? No more sacrifices, no more sin-bearing, no more curse for the chosen of God. It is finished. The entire work of redemption of humanity has been totally brought into completion. It is finished. There is joy in that. We no longer have to worry or exist under people being so worried about their lives and about their salvation. And about their future. Once we come to Christ. It all takes place. And he cannot wait to start his journey with you. So I urge you. This night. If you do not know Jesus Christ. As your Lord and Savior. I urge you to pray to him and say. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you lived a sinless and a holy life here on earth and that you were crucified and killed to take away my sin. I confess my sin before you now and ask that you, if you would come into my heart as my Lord and my Savior that you would forgive my sin and transform my life as my Lord and my Savior. I receive you into my life and my heart, and I thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing for me. This I ask in your most precious name, Lord. Amen. Now, if you did pray that prayer, I ask you to contact us at Pinson United Methodist Church here in Pinson, Alabama. And somebody will there be there to talk to you or I will talk to you. You have started your newest journey into eternity this day. Take your, your, your name.